Europe has a rich and deeply rooted religious heritage. Its unique buildings, tranquil spaces, and exquisite artifacts encompass the diversity of European culture and identity. This religious heritage is an invaluable resource that is handed over to us for all generations to enjoy. It is all around us and an integral part of our lives and communities. It includes rich cultural traditions, masterpieces of art, wonderful craftsmanship, and extraordinary music. In an era of globalization, cultural heritage helps us to remember our European cultural diversity, and its understanding develops mutual respect and contributes to dialogue amongst different cultures. The future of religious heritage presents us with challenges and opportunities. Knowledge transfer and innovation will be needed to hand over this remarkable patrimony to future generations. From the creative reuse of historic buildings to educational opportunities, from both real and virtual tourism to strengthening communities, the value of religious heritage is almost limitless. It is up to us to make the most of its potential. Since 2011, Future for Religious Heritage, a European network, has brought together charities, conservation experts, governmental, religious and university institutions, as well as other professionals. FRH is a non-faith, not-for-profit organization that draws its strength from its diverse network. Our mission is to understand the challenges facing religious heritage, as well as the opportunities it presents to develop solutions for the 21st century. Our ambition is to maintain a network of European organizations with a strong structural framework for ongoing intercultural exchanges regarding the protection, conservation, and management of religious heritage. This network is open to you. Please join us now. Every time I watch this FRH video, specially created to bring the message of the importance of religious heritage and to open the opportunity to join the network, it makes me proud and it gives me a feeling of comfort to be a part of this network that is working together to find solutions to hand over this remarkable patrimony to future generations. It is a joint effort as all over Europe, religious heritage and its preservation for the future is under pressure, indifference, financial distress and lack of conservation of buildings and art treasures accelerate the impending loss of it. Whenever one of them is lost, destroyed or damaged, we all lose a piece of our identity. We all felt the huge losses with the tragedy of Notre Dame and the organ in Nantes, which will be silent forever. This is a shared feeling with millions of people around the world because with them, it disappears the work of the many generations of craftsmen, architects, stonemasons, artists, musicians, copyists, and painters with their limited tools and vast knowledge and masterful skills. As president of FRH, I have the honor to welcome you in FRH 10th anniversary to the biennial conference Europe's Living Religious Heritage. Bona tarda, Barcelona. Good afternoon to, to all of you. Our first live stream conference in FRH. Wow. I would have loved to be with you, but today I greet you from Cantabria, Spain, from Potes, the place from which uh, Beato de Liebana established uh, Santiago Apostol um, as patron of Hispania and was paving the way for the king some years later to start his first trip to Santiago de Compostela and the Camino de Santiago was born. Actually, I am calling in from the Centro de Estudios Levaniegos, a living heritage site in the north of Spain, a 14th century church reused as a, a center for arts and culture, known as CEL, as you can see, which, by the way, means sky in Catalan. From this center, we support and steer the pilgrimage in the region. Hosting you all in Barcelona, it would have been fantastic. And of course, a totally different uh, experience of perceiving together the magnificent and diverse religious heritage of this wonderful city. But at the same time, I'm happy to admit that the restrictions due to the pandemics that affected our organization, like many others all around Europe, made us improve our digital skills as a network. This new format of conference pushed us into the world 
We had to learn and adapt to the new circumstances in this era of digitization. The strength of a network implies working harness, sharing and learning together from these and other challenges. We are joined through the digital web from all over Europe at the same moment. One could never have imagined this in the past. I'm pleased to tell you that this new format is allowing so many people from all corners of Europe and beyond to join in without traveling that the number of registrations is bigger than ever, to the point that I'm sure we will keep this hybrid uh, system as a permanent one. This way, all our members, without exception, will have the same chances to attend despite travel costs or agenda conflicts. Because events like this one are crucial to create social change in the citizenship. The more who can join in, the stronger the voice of the network will become. Being in our 10th year university, I just want to briefly touch upon what was already achieved by working together. FRH is today the largest independent, non-faith, not-for-profit organization in Europe working to safeguard and protect religious heritage buildings and their contents. We are more than 70 institutions and more than 100 professionals, experts and supporters from more than 35 countries. We can proudly say that FRH is now, since 2017, one of the 28 European networks that is supported by the Creative Europe Programme of the European Union. FRH has proved that we can cope with adversity and offer a rich calendar of interesting events and activities. Building upon from the success of the 2018 European Year of Cultural Heritage Initiative, the Torch for Heritage, and culture, to the COVID-proof Jump for Heritage campaign launched precisely in the pandemics. So my gratitude on behalf of FRH to Sebastián Álvaro, famous international sportsman, mountaineer and writer for his fierce support to our Jump for Heritage campaign, bringing together sports and heritage. Here FRH showcases how young Europeans all over Europe are proud of their religious heritage. It has been an enormous success Hundreds of amazing photos were received from people experiencing a moment of joy while sharing their religious sites from all over Europe on social media and with us. As a part of the campaign, a competition was launched. Today, we will learn about the winners and Mr. Sebas Alvaro will hand over the prize to them. Thank you very much to all the participants who helped bringing awareness to Europe's religious buildings by doing so. Now, FRH is also a proud member of the Commission's European Expert Heritage Group and a founding member of the European Heritage Alliance and an officially recognized partner of the new European Bauhaus. As such, I am pleased to have today Alessandro Rancati, representative of the new European Bauhaus, to explain what the aims are and how can we all contribute with it. Here, I would like to express also my sincere gratitude to our sponsors and friends for their valuable support. FRH Network would not exist without them. Altogether, we ensure the voice of religious heritage is heard. And now the theme, Europe's living religious heritage. Let me explain that the new format consists of four hybrid events live broadcasted from studios in Spain, Italy, Germany, and Belgium. Now, each hybrid event would last two hours and will have a different um, so theme. Starting now in Barcelona, the second one would be in September in Bologna, the third one in October in Blankenburg, and the fourth and final one in uh, November in Brussels. I am personally pleased for such a diverse program, based upon the input of four working groups consisting of experts and students, one per event, that have been created with this specific purpose. My gratitude to them for their commitment, inspiration, patience, and for their enormous, enormous flexibility to adapt constantly and repeatedly to the numerous changes in format over the past one year and a half, till this final one, which we all are sharing today. My gratitude to the conference committee with Jan Jaspers and Henry Lindland as its co-chairs, and I would like to also uh, single out Lillian Krutzwagers, president of the FRH Advisory Board, for her great contribution in making all this possible with her knowledge, 
and vision of the issues and actions facing religious heritage across Europe. As I said before, lots of challenges, but we succeed all together as a solid network. Special thanks to our council member, Dr. Justin Krusen, who is chairing today from the MACBA studios in Barcelona, to our co-host, Silvia Audle from the University of Girona, and our Spanish panelists, who agreed to be in the studio to reflect and discuss upon the presentations. You know, I wish I could sneak today at the end of these two hours in your homes or offices through your computers and see you motivated and, and inspired as I am. Dear Justin, I wish you all the best of luck and I have now my notebook ready and a couple of good pens to take my notes. Looking forward to an inspiring meeting. Thank you. Wonderful, Pilar. Thank you very much for your inspiring words on behalf of FRH. A warm welcome to all of viewers wherever you are in Europe and beyond to this live broadcast on living religious heritage, focusing on continuity in function or use. My name is Justin Krusen and I will be your day chair today. We are broadcasting here from the auditorium at uh, MACBA, the Museum of Modern Art in Barcelona. I have the honor and the challenge, to be honest, to take you through this first of four hybrid events, as our president has announced, that will take place over the coming months in different cities across Europe. I am a professor of religious art at the University of Bergen in Norway, but happen to spend this semester here in Catalonia as a guest lecturer at the University of Girona. As I am also a member of the Council of FRH, I was asked to moderate this event. This afternoon, we will have a live studio broadcast that includes several international online contributions that will be reflected upon in the first place by a panel of experts here in the studio. I am pleased to see so many participants connected in so many different countries in Europe and beyond. You are all invited to take part in the conversation via the chat that you will find on this page. Here you may post questions or comments to presenters and panelists. The chat box will be moderated by FRH manager Jordi Majarak. With me in the studio today are three experts on religious heritage. First is Silvia Oulet, who has co-organized this meeting here in Catalonia. She's a professor at the University of Girona and a researcher in the field of religious heritage and tourism. Welcome, Silvia. Second is Chiara Curti, who is an architect specialized in religious heritage studies, and she is especially interested in the combination of modern art and historical heritage, and she's also connected to Barcelona City of Organs. Welcome, Chiara. And third is Marc Sureda, who is the content editor for Catalonia Sacra, a digital platform on religious heritage in Catalonia. He is curator at the Episcopal Museum of Bic and a researcher of art and liturgy, particularly in the Middle Ages. Welcome, Marc. Due to COVID restrictions, we have had to postpone and eventually also reduce our planned conference here in Barcelona to this studio event. For obvious reasons, we could not invite panelists from all over the continent. But although our panelists here have our daily work here in Catalonia, they all collaborate in many international networks and will reflect on the topics raised on a level that transcends regional and national borders. Let us move now to our first intervention that was prepared by a working uh, by a working group on continuity in function or use. This group, consisting of heritage experts and students from all over Europe, had several online meetings, chaired by Hendrik Lindblad and Lilian Grootswagers. Hendrik Lindblad, who is also an FRH council member, will be our first speaker, sharing the output of the group with all of us in order to kickstart the discussion. Due to the challenges of running a hybrid event, 
We received Henrik's video message before this meeting, but of course he is attending live today and he will be available to address questions and participate in the discussions. His presentation will be, be immediately followed by a video by Nigel Walter and Johannes Paulios, who share some more reflections on today's topic on continuity in function and use. Nigel Walter is an architect and specialist on cultural heritage based in the UK. He is the director of Archangel, a Cambridge-based architect's practice. He is the author of several books on heritage preservation in a constantly changing world. Book titles include To Live is to Change and as co-author Buildings for a Mission, a complete guide to the care, conservation and development of churches. Johannes Paulios is a consultant and associate professor focusing on living heritage, business strategies and sustainable development at the Center of Heritage Management at Ahmedabad University in India. Among books published by him are The Past and the Present, a living heritage approach which focuses on the Meteora monasteries in Greece. And just to remind you, when you see the videos, you may post your questions and comments in the chat at all times so they can be brought up into the discussion here in Barcelona. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, Hendrik Limblad, uh, FRH Council Member and Coordinator of the Working Group A. Uh, if you want to give us a, an introduction on your working group and, and how they prepared for, for this conference event. Uh, hello all and uh, thank you Jordi. Yes, uh, I surely will. So uh, I'm a FRH member of the Council and also co-chair of the working group that has now produced a draft statement on the uh, continuity of use, which is the, uh, the first sub-theme uh, of this uh, 2021 conference by FRH. And uh, we have a draft statement. Uh, that is the result of the uh, discussions in our group. We were between 10 to 15 members of the group from different countries uh, with different backgrounds, academics and, and practitioners and also students and uh, of various ages. So uh, um, we have um, <clears throat> we had two workshops uh, with very creative discussions and these were based on, uh, on the um, characterization of living heritage that we found in different documents, uh, articles produced by ICROM, the Preservation Center uh, in Rome. Uh, affiliated with UNESCO, and also by other researchers, uh, researchers and, and uh, individuals. Um, so this is the uh, definition that we think is the current one of living heritage. Uh, and that is a heritage that has been in use and is in use for its original or traditional purposes. Uh, it's also having strong bonds with a so-called core community which might be the uh, relig religious community when it's a religious site. Uh, and it's also characterized by continuity in four specific aspects. And these are actually the same sub-themes as we have defined for our conference. So that is uh, continuity on use, function, uh, con continuity of uh, community connection, that is uh, basically the uh, core community that is connected to the group or, or to the site. Uh, and it's also uh, uh, defined by its evolving cultural expressions uh, that is continuous on this site and also by the uh, continuity of care and maintenance. Uh, so that is the, um, as we uh, believe is the uh, like a formal or official uh, definition of a living heritage. Uh, and based on this um, definition or characterization, uh, we had uh, a couple of workshops, very creative workshops with very intense discussions on is this relevant to FRH and its purposes? 
uh, and we believe it is, but we also think it needs to be slightly reformulated. Uh, so we have five different uh, statements or items that are the main conclusions of our discussions. And first of all, we think that the definitions of cultural heritage and living heritage need to be broader uh, compared with the, uh, the valid uh, or current definition of living heritage. Uh, we also believe that continuity can be interrupted. We have seen that, that in history many times, actually, churches closed um, and then reopened again, other religious sites, of course. Uh, and when they are reopened again, uh, continuity can be renewed. Uh, and number three, uh, it's always not possible with the traditional use. Uh, <clears throat> if there is no uh, religious community anymore connected to the site, then we will uh, must encourage adaptive reuse of this site. That's, that can be done in many different ways. Uh, of course, uh, and um, beside the core community, uh, we also believe that there should be a plural plurality of heritage communities. That means many heritage communities that can have interest uh, and uh, have the rights to access a site, and not only the core community. And finally, um, we also believe that the approach of um, cultural heritage values that is basically on um, the importance of, of uh, assess the values of a site and then manage these values. That is a complementary approach to living heritage. So these are not opposed, opposed but should be uh, working together, so to speak. Uh, and uh, in our statement, we have also elaborated every main uh, finding uh, which I will not go through now, but which you can read on, on the website. Uh, presentation is placed there. Uh, and we are, of course, then encouraging um, uh, comments, ideas. Uh, are we right in this? Are we completely wrong? Or, or do you want to add anything? So that will be possible in different ways to contribute to this statement. That is, a, of course, a living document. It's just a draft. We will continue the discussions here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Hendrik Lindblad. And uh, we encourage the audience to, to share any questions or comments you may have, and also to contact us uh, via info at frh-europe.org if you want to add to the conversation. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Nigel Walter. Juanes Pulios and I are delighted to have the opportunity of offering some opening comments for this conference on the important subject of living heritage. For both of us, living heritage has formed a focus for our research. Our approaches are distinct but complementary. I am a specialist conservation architect working with protected church buildings who is also active in research. Juanes is an academic with an interest in practice and it was he who first identified the four aspects of continuity around which these four FRH conference events are structured. Function, community connection, cultural expressions, and care. First, here is Ioannis. Hello, some thoughts on the relationship between the living heritage approach and the adaptive reuse of religious sites. First of all, living heritage approach is not opposed to values-based approach, as values-based approach is not opposed to the conventional material-based approach. All these approaches are different, and it is up to us, the heritage managers of the sites, to choose which, to decide which approach to choose or which particular elements of each approach to choose or combine, depending on the site and also on the time period. 
A key question for the conservation management of a religious site is that this site witnesses a break of continuity. So what? All living religious sites have witnessed breaks of continuity throughout the course of their history. So the key question is whether this break of continuity is a temporary or a, practical or, or a permanent one. Practically, we cannot really tell, because if we take the examples of Meteora and Mount Athos monastic complexes in Greece, they went through severe period of decline, then two Balkan wars, two world wars, a civil war, and everybody would argue for the, a permanent break of continuity. Yet, the monastic communities got re-established in, in the sites and they have been flourishing to the, to the present date. Also, on a theoretical basis, can we, uh, heritage managers, have the authority to decide on the death of Christian faith in UK, in UK and Europe, while at the same time there are still community groups who follow Christianity? But even if the break of continuity is a permanent one, can we tell that this side has no longer any spiritual significance in it at all? Take the example of the Soviet Union, of Russia. People are getting back to Christianity and possibly to a new type of spiritual connection with Christian sites. But even if we tell that this break of continuity is a permanent one and this site has no spiritual significance at all, however, is this site considered to be the same with the Acropolis in Athens whose religious function ceased some millennia ago? given that community groups still have vivid memories of the living religious functions of these places. Another key question uh, regarding the adapted reuse of religious sites are, is, are all adapted reuse options the same? Archaeological site, tourism attraction, museum, library, cafe, nightclub? Is a religious site converted into a cafe the same with any local cafe? Or are there any, do we have the option of parallel diverse functions within the site? Church plus cafe plus nightclub? Conclude, Reli living religious sites are currently going through a period of dramatic change and face breaks of continuity due to changes in the internal, internal environment, but also due to changes in the external environment. However, this has been the case of all living religious sites throughout their history. I firmly believe that the living heritage approach is relevant to periods of dramatic change like the one we are currently going through, because the living heritage approach focuses on continuity and at the same time embraces change focuses on the core community and at the same time embraces all other communities. The living heritage approach is still re relevant either on its own or in connection to the values-based approach. On a final note, there is always a gap between the present and the past. We, the people of the present, try to look through a small hole into the past and the past is filled with mystery and awe for us and the door between the present and the past is always locked. It is only the core community, the present community, that, uh, that can unlock the door and unveil the mysteries of, and the secrets of the departed ones to us. As I said before, I am a specialist conservation architect and I work mostly with medieval parish churches in the east of England. My interest in living heritage develops from my practical concern for the future of these outstanding buildings, almost all of which remain in use. I see two distinctive aspects of a living heritage approach that are of particular relevance. The first is that the heritage of the church building does not lie simply in its material structure and fabric, its bricks and its stones, but nor does it lie simply in the people as intangible heritage approaches may sometimes suggest. Rather, it lies in the nexus, literally the binding together of people and physical fabric through time. This is the treasure that we as professional, professionals in heritage 
are tasked with conserving. In Britain, we have a nursery rhyme with actions which goes like this. This is the church. This is the steeple. Open the doors and here are the people. The question that heritage needs to answer is, where are the people? That animating core community is integral to the heritage, but does modern conservation sometimes serve to exclude those people most closely associated with the building? As experts, we must confront the uncomfortable possibility that our conservation and heritage processes that disempower that core community will themselves undermine heritage or even destroy it. Second, I find it helpful to see historic buildings such as these as living entities. The buildings with which I work have typically experienced multiple phases of significant change and have complex stories to tell. For example, here is the church of St Lawrence Southo near Cambridge, and this is its plan. Note the different hatching which shows the multiple episodes of change from the 12th century onwards. Two things must be acknowledged about this biography of change. First, these buildings owe their character and delight to that developmental history. And second, it is precisely because they have been able to change that they have survived. And yet the standard conservation approach treats them as completed art objects and entails a presumption against change. In that sense, modern conservation offers such buildings no future. It's for this reason that I have proposed what I call a narrative approach to conservation, that historic buildings like these are best understood as communal narratives. The metaphor suggests that while the building remains living, our task should never be to close down the narrative, but rather to allow it to develop. To add a successful chapter to that narrative in this generation requires first that we understand the story to date, second that we compose as compelling a chapter as we can, and third that we leave narrative threads open for future generations who will continue the story. At Southo, we plan to create a community hub. Here is the delightful project logo which was created by a group of local children. The project will involve removing the fixed seating from the nave, adding modern facilities shown in red, and allowing much greater use by the wider community while the church will still remain consecrated for worship. So this is not adaptive reuse, but holding worship and community uses together within the same space, perhaps even at the same time. It's a solution that the Church of England actively encourages. And here is the Church of St Nicholas, Great Wilbraham, again a building of medieval origin with Victorian alterations. Here, the scheme included a toilet and kitchen in the base of the West Tower, a new open gallery above for bell ringers, and the limited removal of pews to create a gathering space at the rear. These changes are unmistakably of their age, with modern detailing to the oak and the glass. In narrative terms, the works comprise a distinct chapter in the ongoing story of the building, but one that works with the grain of the story to date. Practically speaking, the changes enable the building to host more events, including with catering, again bringing broader community uses back into the building. We see this as a return to the medieval understanding of the parish church as the hub of its community. In finishing, I want to identify three aspects of the living heritage approach as it applies to these church buildings. First, living heritage accounts for continuity across time, which is essential to any active tradition. Second, living heritage sees historic buildings as mid-narrative rather than as completed art objects, thus allowing for future cultural production. Third, Living heritage allows a voice for and ownership by the local community, not just the heritage experts like myself. Juanis and I do hope that these introductory comments will be helpful in provoking discussion, and we very much look forward to the comments of colleagues.
Living heritage, working with an ongoing story of a site or a monument. How do you do that? Communities change, new communities pop up, the core community, what happens? We should not forget about it. I think these interventions have brought us right in the middle of the discussion we aim to, to make, to uh, participate in today and to bring on the floor. And uh, because it, I think it connects to what we all work with. We all work with communities and places that bring their story with them and that we try to preserve and thus also make a useful chapter too. Eh? We try to add something. So I think, I think many terms pop up here, but I think one of the two core terms I think are community. And this change in community has always changed, but there will be a community in the future too. How do you connect to that change in community? And on the other hand, of course, then how do you ensure continuity, community and continuity? So may I perhaps pose these two keywords uh, here on the podium and, and invite you to reflect on that. How do you, in your work with your organization, uh, connect to these two aspects? Um, and maybe, Mark Sureda, may, maybe I can start with you uh, on behalf of Catalonia Sacra. Could you perhaps give us an impression on, on how you work with this? How do you work with an ongoing story? Thank you, Justin, for the question and thank you to FRH for, uh, for inviting me. Uh, indeed, uh, crucial questions have been posed and uh, with a lot of nuances that, that should, be, should be clarified with respect to every context because the relationship between communities and heritage uh, as a particular frame in every in every case, and I, I could speak here uh, from my own experience, referring to what would we now here in Catalonia, for instance, uh, in which I think we uh, we are in a previous panorama of uh, the one that has been evoked, for instance, for the UK. Uh, uh, speaking only about the uh, the uh, Catholic Church in Catalonia, that is. Uh, uh, we, they, have been, they have been counted, it's, it's 4,050 buildings mm. belonging to the church now, so the worship buildings, excluding from other confessions, but here due to historical reasons, uh, we can consider that it's largely the, the lion's share of the, of the issue. Yeah. And uh, the problem is that we can identify two types of communities using this, but we could say that the, we are not still in the situation of a break in continuity because the core communities keep using this, these buildings, but perhaps they use it, for instance, in, in rural context, once a month or once a year mm -hmm. even. Yeah. So the, the use of the core communities has not been interrupted, but has been some, um, somehow fading from, from a, a continuity exactly. panorama. Yeah. And then instead we have other communities or the communities, the white community who are aiming to, which are the white social communities and visitors and tourism communities. And, uh, and, and the problem is that uh, they don't see those communities, if they can be identified, they don't forcibly see each, each other in terms of continuity. Mm -hmm or they have difficulties in recognizing each other. And recognizing each other, in, yeah. in In rural context, for instance, then you have the, this, this, uh, these communities that are somehow producing, and in urban context, where the situation is more alive, we could say, uh, for instance, here in Barcelona, uh, dynamics, some dynamics links to tourism, for instance, intervene. And then in, in places like Santa Maria del Mar, mm. uh, non-religious use are widely larger than religious uses. And then the two communities don't communicate with yeah. each other. But those are very special cases, of course. And yes, but mm, they can be noticed. Mm -hmm. And they, they have an example value, I think. And, and, uh, and then the, the, the challenge is here to assure some continuity instead of a gap, because the risk yeah. is it's having a gap. Mm -hmm. So Catalonia Sacra, I, I have to speak here in a very general way, but Catalonia Sacra is not only a, a digital platform, but a project or, or a an organization of the 10 Catholic dioceses based, based in Catalonia, mm -hmm. whose primary aim is not religious, not in terms, let's say, of preaching the faith, but uh, the, the aim is to open this heritage to exactly. everyone, to provide tools for interpretation and enjoying this heritage, mm -hmm. 
and uh, let's say to sum it up to to stress the cultural and spiritual values of this heritage without losing contact with its its primary its primary values and so, primary yes. identity so there's the core community again yeah. Yep. And and Never it, is, it is difficult to get somehow the, the core community involved. Mm. And we have to start working this from the point of view of tourism and heritage. That's the point of the heritage experts that try to, uh, by now, to deal with that. But to offer this as a cultural uh, products, if you want, or yeah. to cultural things that can be interesting for everyone, and trying to connect people with the experience of the original identity of it. Yep. We do it uh, mainly with cultural activity, mainstream cultural activity, mm -hmm. but we have to explore other other forms. And one of the forms, for instance, is to uh, to make um, accessible this heritage with uh, intangible heritage, mm -hmm. feasts, celebrations, exactly. popular activities linked to popular culture. You have a this lot of that of here the, in Catalonia. Yes, this, that, yes, this is one, that. Of the, one of the one of the one of the sectors we are interested in. Yep. Lastly. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, Silvia, would you like to add up on, on that? Yeah, the, j just to complement, because uh, I think that we are mainly in the same line, but um, following your ideas of having like, well, you didn't mention two communities, but having different uses of, of heritage. I think that in following one of the speaker's videos, the, um, he was mentioning the narrative approach. Mm -hmm. So I think that we are facing like different narratives because it's not only past, present and future, but our present is, is very complex. So in this present we have, or, or we should face this idea of having multiple narratives in the same site. And, yeah. and this is a question that, that can be, should be addressed by using different interpretation tools, for example, or by having different yeah, activities that can bring these different uses together without uh, excluding anybody. Right. So you think that now we're in a, a moment in time when we have to provide for multiple uh, next chapters and not only the one that was uh, connected to its core uh, function uh, in history. Yeah, that's yeah. a challenge. It's a challenge it and is. I think it's a duty. <laughs> we must. Yeah. yeah, it's the only way to keep yeah. alive, to keep life uh, buzzing around and in these churches and, and, and monuments and sites. I'm pretty sure about that. So I think always looking at the future, you first think about children. Uh, how do you connect young people to places that are very old? I mean, uh, putting it like this, there may be also, uh, it puts a challenge. Uh, to, to, uh, it, how do you connect specifically to youngsters in communities that are maybe not natural uh, church goers or participants in the original function of these of these monuments anymore. Do you have special uh, children's programs, for example, in Catalonia Sacra? Or no, we haven't developed specific programs for for children now. Mm -hmm. We are stressing the idea of making our activities available for everyone, so for families, even for familiar activities. Uh -huh. One uh, good thing about that is that the intangible heritage linked to the churches. Uh, is indeed for everyone. Yeah. For instance, a popular celebration or Corpus Christi here in Barcelona that was a very popular exactly. celebration can, can have attractions both yeah. for, for youngers and for adult people and for uh, people linked to the tradition and people who does not feel linked, directly linked to that. Uh, but we have not developed specific programs for that in Catalonia Sacra. It will be in a further step. Yeah, exactly. So I think Ensuring this future through youngsters, children, I think is, is one of the core um, activities of uh, what the, uh, the, the uh, Stichting uh, Oude Groninger Kerken in the Netherlands uh, is, is, has been developing uh, uh, over the last uh, year. So I think this is sort of a bridge to, uh, what, uh, to our next uh, item in this program where, that will be uh, presented by Patty Wageman uh, on historical church project in, uh, in the Dutch province of Groningen. So our next speaker, I would like to uh, introduce her uh, briefly. Our next speaker today is Patty Wageman. She is the director of the Foundation of Old Groningen Churches, the Stichting Oude Groninger Kerken, in this province of that name in the north of the Netherlands. She will show us how this organization has, over the past 50 years, brought religious heritage to life within the community, communities 
opening up new functions and uses while preserving the historical fabric of old churches. Her video will be followed by a short next video that showcases the award-winning project of the school church in Garmerwolde. Thank you very much, Betty, for your willingness to contribute to this event. And I may also, on behalf of FRH, congratulate you on the nomination of the 2021 European Heritage Awards that are organized by Europa Nostra. A fantastic achievement. Of course, we invite all participants to vote and make sure that this project will also then, next step, win the public award. This would, of course, greatly reflect, greatly reflect on all of us, in fact, uh, in our aim to raise awareness of religious heritage. The link to the vote will be provided to you later uh, in a follow-up email. Betty Wageman, may I invite you to start the video. Today, I will show you an example in this section of Europe's Living Religious Heritage Conference. It regards our ambitious project, the school church in Germerwolde, this project was opened last year in February. This week we received the European Heritage Award and we are very honored and proud to bring this project to you today in a short presentation and film. In this presentation I will tell you about why this concept suits our foundation and how it came about. My name is Betty Wageman. I'm director of the Groningen Churches Foundation, which aims to preserve religious cultural heritage situated in the province of Groningen. Apart from preservation, it strives to enhance interest in this heritage and share knowledge of it. The Groningen Historic Churches Foundation was found in 1969 at a time when secularization in the Netherlands was rising rapidly especially in Groningen, less and less people attended church. On top of this problem, the province of Groningen was facing depopulation as young people left for the western parts of the Netherlands to live and work. As a result, the elderly stayed behind with all the consequences that came with it. One of these consequences was that the church buildings were abandoned and started to deteriorate. The Groningen Historic Churches Foundation was founded to bring this development to a halt and to make people aware of this unique heritage that determines our landscape and plays such an important part of our history, locally and nationally. From the beginning, it was clear that this foundation should not only preserve and restore, but also inform, share and research. And we've been doing so for over 50 years. Here you can see the first acquisition, the church in Leegkerk, which is nowadays in a far better state and used for many activities. At this moment, we are the owner of 96 churches, two synagogues, nine towers, 59 churchyards. Our office consists of 16 employees, and apart from this, 700 volunteers are active in our churches. We receive donations from 6,000 6, people from all over the Netherlands and beyond. On the map, you see the province of Groningen, situated in the north of the Netherlands. It is a special region, and together with Friesland, northern Germany and western Denmark, it borders on the Wadensee, you see here in your left, which is UNESCO heritage. It is this region, in this region you will find the largest density of medieval churches in Europe. Preservation means that we of course keep our churches in good condition, but it also means that we regularly uh, execute large restoration projects, which, are we, with, which we are able to carry out in collaboration with various specialists. All these pro projects are supported by public and private funding. Apart from preservation, we also work on new destinations for some churches. With new destinations, you can think of various functions instead of a religious function only. In this sense, we want to contribute to living heritage. The school church can be regarded in this last category and is an example of the way we see the role of education for our foundation. We think education cannot start early enough. Here you see small children being taken on a hard head tour during a restoration project. We think it is important to generate new meaning for the future through education. The church can be an important instrument in this case as they are a reflection of our society through the ages. 
Therefore, we think that the church is a good place to speak about sometimes difficult subjects connect connected with religion, identity and society. In 2014, Museum Katerijne Convent in Utrecht, a museum for Christian art, approached us for their exhibition, Holidays Know What You Celebrate. They were looking for partners throughout the Netherlands to help to teach children about holidays and traditions from various religions. More than half of the Dutch people think of themselves as secular, with, which results in the fact that many don't know the background or meaning of their own national holidays anymore, such as Ascension or Pentecost, or why we celebrate them. This project teaches children about backgrounds and traditions, not only Christians, but also Islamic, Jewish, Hindu and Buddhist traditions, all of which are celebrated by people in the Netherlands. Holidays and feasts are a positive and recognizable way to address these topics, such as religion and identity, which are often now regarded as difficult themes. The teaching material focuses on the, today's children, the underlying themes of the holidays are linked to children's everyday life in order to make them relevant and easy to talk about. Every museum in this partnership designs its own exhibition and here you see some examples. The most important aspect of this project is to initiate and create a dialogue between children. Dialogue is very natural and an important way of how children interact. This is the best way to get to understand each other and to inform of, uh, each other of how, how and why not all holidays are the same in every religion. But it is also meant to discover where there might be similarities. Dialogue creates mutual understanding and in the end, a better society. For this project, we use the I ask method, which is an instrument of how to create a dialogue by people, uh, between people by asking certain questions. This method became also important in how the design of the exhibition in the school church and the educational programs we offer were developed. As it turned out in the project Holidays Know What You Celebrate, we are the only non-museum partner. When looking for the proper place to house an exhibition, we turned to this wonderful and rather big church in the village of Garmerwolde, just east on the outskirts of the city of Groningen. The church is a beautiful example of 14th century Romanesque architecture with its typical decorative brickwork, which is unique for the north. As you can see, the medieval tower stands separate from the church building. The reason to choose this church were the extraordinary vault paintings in the vaults. They were painted in the 15th century and celebrate the cycle of life of Mary and Jesus in the depiction of Christ, Christmas and Easter, the two biggest festive days in Christianity. In other words, they turned out to be a logical starting point and were leading elements in the development of our exhibition for this project, which we named Feast in Western East. The church itself was not suitable for our permanent exhibition as it has a multifunctional use, such as funerals and weddings and village activities and so on. The medieval bell tower, however, was perfect for our exhibition, albeit that we needed to stretch the idea of how you can install an exhibition in a space that is mainly vertical. The exhibition slowly makes its way uh, up the staircase, passing ancient bricks and beams and a monumental bell in the middle. On your way up and down through the tower, you encounter visualizations of eight holidays from Christian and Islamic traditions. The choice for Christian and Islamic holidays were fed by the fact that these are the two largest religions in the Netherlands. An audio tour leads you through the exhibition. In this tour, several questions are asked as well. Primary schools can book the education program Feast in East, West and East, including travel arrangement and material to work on in the classroom after visiting the school church. The program contains a guided group dialogue in the medieval church, a visit to the exhibition and educational games. With this project, we contribute to and offer a platform for the intercultural dialogue in the Netherlands. Our focus is on similarities, not differences between people and communities. We celebrate diversity. Once in the top of the tower, you can look out over the Groningen landscape 
and reminiscent about what you've just seen or how long this tower has been a beacon for others in past and present. It is our view that education does not stop with the school church. For children, it is a first step in sharing knowledge and do research, but children grow up and take this with them. Apart from the school church, which is aimed at primary education, we develop projects with secondary schools as well as collaborate with, university, uh, in, with the university in research projects. As said, this project won the European um, Heritage Award 2021 just this week, but we can also win a public award and therefore we would like to invite you to vote for this unique project so we can share this with as many people as possible. Our dream is to find another venue where we can help to create this project again in a site-specific religious location in collaboration with a local society. As a member of Future for Religious Heritage, we therefore reach out to other partners who might be interested. Thank you for your attention. I will start the film now. Ik ben Christian Velvers, ik ben bouwkundige bij de Stichting Oude Groningen Kerken. De Stichting Oude Groningen Kerken heeft uh, bijna 100 kerken in uh, eigendom in de provincie Groningen, in het noorden van Nederland. Uh, het doel van de stichting is het uh, in stand houden van deze kerken, maar ook het bevorderen van de belangstelling voor deze kerken. We staan hier bij de middeleeuwse kerk van Garmerwolde, een prachtige 13e eeuwse kerk met daarnaast een prachtige 13e eeuwse toren. Hier heeft de Stichting Oude Groningen Kerken in de afgelopen jaren een heel bijzonder project gedaan waarbij een middeleeuws erfgoed is gecombineerd met hele moderne architectuur. Ook gecombineerd met een educatief project en dat ook weer in combinatie met alle plaatselijke mensen die hier wonen. Ik ben Inge Basteleur, ik ben projectleider educatie bij de Stichting Oude Groningen Kerken. In de toren is een cyclische trap gemaakt. Je gaat via de ene trap omhoog en via de andere weer naar beneden. En onderweg kom je kleine kamers tegen en die verbeelden acht feesten. Het zijn vier feesten uit de islam en vier feesten uit het christendom. En op die manier maak je dus kennis met die feesten. En dat is op een interactieve manier. Op bijna elk feest moet je ook even iets doen. En zo gaan we in op de achterliggende verhalen bij die feesten. Als stichting hebben we een creatief team gevormd met mensen vanuit de stichting, dus bouwkundigen, maar ook mensen vanuit de educatiekant. En maar ook juist met, met jonge uh, ontwerpers, een jonge architect uit Groningen, jonge designers daarbij. Maar ook mensen vanuit de Rijksuniversiteit, mensen vanuit de plaatselijke commissie hier in de Garmerwolde. En al die mensen zijn samen gaan zitten om tot een gezamenlijk ontwerp te komen. Het was best een complexe opgave, want het is een middeleeuwse toren met monumentale balken die er dus niet uit mochten. Er hangt nog een grote klok in, die moest er ook in blijven. Dus het ontwerp is eigenlijk een soort limbo dansende trap geworden die daar helemaal omheen en doorheen gaat. Maar het resultaat is spectaculair en dat hadden we van tevoren echt niet kunnen bedenken. Dit is het ontvangstgebouw wat we aan de rand van het kerkhof hebben gebouwd. Dit is de plek waar bezoekers als eerste ontvangen worden. Hier kunnen ze een kopje koffie drinken. Hier zit een horecafunctie zit erin. Het is ook de plek waar bezoekers een toegang kunnen krijgen tot de toren onder andere. En aan de andere kant zien we, zien we de achterkant de Middeleeuwse kerk waarbij het schip van het gedeelte van de kerk is in de 19e eeuw afgebroken. Destijds was er te weinig geld om het nog te onderhouden en dan was het heel bouwvallig geworden. In eerste instantie wilde men de hele kerk afbreken, maar door geldgebrek heeft men slechts het schip afgebroken. Duurzaamheid is voor de stichting een heel belangrijk onderwerp. Het verduurzamen van, van middeleeuws erfgoed is een, is een hele lastige opgave. Omdat je eigenlijk aan de buitenkant en aan de binnenkant van zo'n gebouw eigenlijk niks kan doen. Doordat we een nieuw gebouw konden neerzetten, konden we ook een heel duurzaam gebouw neerzetten. Op deze manier kunnen we dus een nieuw gebouw of een, eigenlijk een losstaand gebouw inzetten voor het duurzaam behoud van de rest van ons erfgoed. In de kerk zijn gewelfschilderingen te zien. En die zijn aangebracht in 1520. En aan de ene kant zie je het verhaal van Maria, dat is eigenlijk het kerstverhaal. En aan de andere kant zie je het verhaal van Jezus en dat is het paasverhaal. Maar er zijn ook nog heel veel andere schilderingen te zien van bijvoorbeeld fantasiefiguren en mooie bloemmotieven. En hierboven zie je bijvoorbeeld ook het groenmannetje. 
We hebben hier een programma voor scholen gemaakt. Dus door de week komen hier allerlei schoolklassen naartoe. We beginnen dan in de kerk, zitten we met elkaar in de kring en dan spreken we over uh, die thema's dus. Over feesten, wat vier jij, wat vier ik. Want wat je viert en hoe je dat doet, dat zegt natuurlijk iets over jezelf, over je identiteit. En op die manier proberen we de kinderen warm te maken om alles wat hier in de toren te zien is ook goed te bekijken en daarover na te denken. Kerken zijn een weerspiegeling van de maatschappij. Door de eeuwen heen is hier van alles gebeurd en dat is allemaal te zien in die kerken. Er zijn allerlei sporen van te vinden. Niet alleen in de kerk zelf, maar ook in de omgeving. En op die manier is het een heel rijke leeromgeving. Door mensen hier uit te nodigen en te laten nadenken over dat alles, zorgen we ervoor dat ze hun eigen nieuwe betekenis aan het gebouw geven. En daarmee zorgen we voor draagvlak in de toekomst. Wow, that's a beautiful place. I would really like to visit someday. But be and before we move to our next panel discussion, we ask your attention for the following item. As was already announced by our president, Pilar Baramonde, we are all very pleased to welcome live in our meeting today, Mr. Alessandro Rancati, who will present to us the, in the initiative taken by the Euro Com European Commission called the New European Bauhaus. When it was launched by the President of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, she called on all Europeans to imagine and build together a sustainable and inclusive future that is beautiful for our eyes, minds and souls. Presented as a cultural, environmental and economic initiative with the key words beautiful, sustainable, together we are all eager to learn more about it and especially also how we as religious heritage sector can contribute to it. And I'm happy to inform you moreover that the FRH has recently been recognized as an official partner to this new European Bauhaus. We welcome virtually to Barcelona Mr. Rancati. Could you please, Mr. Rancati, give us as Future for Religious Heritage some more information on what this initiative entails and how, we, how the public can contribute to it? Before I pass the word on to you, I would like to remind all participants once more that you may use the chat for all your questions and comments. Mr. Rancati, may I invite you to present the new European Bauhaus? Yes, thank you very much. And uh, first of all, congratulations for the event. Um, we're seeing uh, uh, examples of, uh, in a certain sense, what could be uh, um, very compatible with the spirit of the new European Bauhaus. Eh? Um, I'd like to start by reminding that the, the words of the president mentioned hope. Uh, in, in, as one of the uh, characteristics of, of this project. Eh? So, so the new European Bauhaus is a project of hope. Um, and, uh, and the emphasis on looking at what already could be identified as, a, as places that are at the same time beautiful, sustainable and inclusive is, is the, the key approach of, of the initiative. So it's not about speculations, it's not about utopia, it's about um, what already is happening uh, that uh, can inspire us, but we can also uh, experience today. And in this sense, I would say that uh, the relevance of, of um, uh, you know, heritage and, and, and religious heritage is, is pretty clear. Huh? We've seen uh, that uh, in, the, in the examples, there are already a lot of the dimensions that uh, surface also on, on, on all the rest of the examples that we are collecting. So the idea that places start to become uh, uh, multidimensional. Uh, that uh, start to become multifunctional, where the idea that uh, we need to go beyond, let's say, the functional aspect of a place 
to include all the immaterial dimensions, all the reflective uh, dimensions is, is, is key. Um, and in this sense, it's, it's where, in, in a certain sense, beautiful becomes uh, um, powerful. Uh, because in, in these uh, uh, cases, beautiful means uh, more than uh, an aesthetic appearance, but it's, it's related to the way we experience a place. And so in places like, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 cultural and religious heritage, we have so much um, history, so much uh, uh, legacy embedded uh, in, in places that they automatically almost become um, places of beauty. No? Um, and so this is for me the relevance um, uh, or, or how it is clear how the, the relevance of uh, of uh, uh, heritage for the European Bauhaus. Um, the way to contribute um, very practically, uh, one is to share these examples through the collection methods that we have. So we have a website, European Bauhaus. In the website, there is a section dedicated to co-design. And in co-design, you can share papers or um, uh, reflections or um, if you if you don't have material that it's um, let's say already elaborated, you can simply go and as a normal citizen, you don't have to be an expert. Then you can go and, and, and say, well, for me, beautiful, sustainable, inclusive um, means uh, what I feel in this place, and this place can be uh, a church or or uh, or uh, the place around the church or or. Uh, or, or a little village where uh, a church uh, becomes, uh, you know, the, the convenient point. And so that's that's a, a very practical way of uh, of uh, contributing. A second way, obviously, is also to um, let's say become a candidate for the prizes. The only problem is that the prizes will close, or the candidacy will close at the end of the month. So um, there's not much time, but uh, uh, the good news is that the prizes focus on what is already there. So it's again a way of collecting examples of uh, what already exists and uh, highlighting it, giving giving it uh, visibility, giving it the, the the relevance that it deserves. And then in the in the future, obviously, we have this idea of the five pilots or pilot projects at the sep in September or uh, and or October that will be launched. And, and this can be, uh, again, um, it's not just about the, the built environment, it's also about the, the place extended, right? so the, in, in extended uh, 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 understanding of the place. Um, and so any project that has to do with cultural uh, heritage, uh, religious heritage is obviously qualified to, to participate. And on top of this, the five pilots are only one of the possible entry points for the European Bauhaus because a lot of parallel and and uh, and uh, support other supporting uh, measures are being uh, developed. So this is this is a uh, more or less what uh, we are um, um, proposing as a way to connect with the project. Um, conversations like today are an obvious way of contributing to the project because it, it, they help to create a better understanding uh, of, of different topics. And I've seen in, in, in the chats on, on YouTube and on reactions, how uh, people just start to realize, for example, the topic that you dis just discussed about how uh, heritage has been not a linear process, but you know, this, this interruptions and what it means. And in a culture like ours that look like uh, everything is very linear, very fast and, and very, you know, um, uninterrupted, uh, just bringing in concept like uh, moments of pause, moments of reflections, moments of, uh, of reconsidering, uh, I think it's very, it's very important. So um, this is a very um, maybe uh, high level uh, explanation of, of, the, of the initiative. There's a lot uh, uh, attached to, to it. Uh, I really invite you to maybe uh, go on our website and, and check the different aspects um, of the initiative, and of course, we are uh, available um, for, for clarifications, for questions, and uh, for uh, continuing this conversation.
for um, thank you very much, Mr. Ancati, for uh, your willingness to present the central tenets of this uh, really fascinating and, and very encompassing program, which will definitely leave a mark uh, on the landscape over the coming years. We very much appreciate this, and we would also like to say that you will hear from us, because this is now uh, our turn to uh, make our contribution. Thank you very much. Um, so now as an official partner, maybe even more motivated to provide examples of good practice uh, in the field of religious heritage that contribute now and in the future to this initiative. I think the words beautiful, sustainable and together may be define uh, uh, religious heritage even more so than other parts of other sectors of heritage in an excellent manner because of course, religious heritage sites are among the most attractive, the most appreciated and most visited mon monuments in Europe, uh, particularly before, because of their beauty uh, that attracts so many people. And then in the second place, religious heritage is perhaps the most sustainable of all types of heritage. Monuments were usually built over many generations, uh, an approach which is called cathedral thinking, and have proven to survive over the course of time. That's why we have them now. And then the aspect of together, which I think is reflected by the fact that most religious buildings have always been public spaces. We have already uh, uh, addressed in our discussion before, accessible to the entire community. And we should try to keep this connection to this community and invite every people, the whole community, everybody in and, and uh, yeah, continuously yeah, uh, enjoy these places and, and add new chapters to them. So thank you very much. Then. Looking to our panel again, I think this has brought up a lot of topics that we have all have our own thoughts about, about uh, how to connect uh, this, this, to this ever-changing uh, community, to new communities, to children's communities. And I would like to pick up on the Groningen uh, Church uh, project, which is explicitly addressed to, to children um, uh, to connect to the monument and make not only a new, but also maybe a different chapter to the history of that place. And I would like to invite you to specifically address this aspect. Uh, and I see Chiara uh, Kurti uh, asking. Uh, yes. Yeah, so may I invite you, could, could you share your thoughts about, uh, about this? With yes, me? I, bueno, pa Patti's intervention really moves me. Mm -hmm. I think that she touched a very important point that uh, the religious heritage is not a space crea created for intellectualism but for a dial uh, dialogue that can only take place in simplicity, like children do. Mm -hmm. So in this case, the children can be a key uh, to discover a spiritual, a different spirituality, uh, realities with a common history, like in this case. No? But um, uh, the involvement of children is a fundamental strategy, I think, because we, the adults, uh, are not longer able to be wonder. So uh, true children uh, without difference uh, can learn and keep uh, to good uh, the transmitter uh, that is transmitted to them. The children uh, will know how to explain it to others, uh, for example, uh, to their families, who perhaps uh, for some prejudice uh, would not have been interested in the heritage in particular. So it's a very privileged uh, channel uh, and uh, the children hold the key. Uh, finally, I think that um, uh, st start from uh, uh, this dialogue with children from the feast, Fest is really, mm -hmm. really important because uh, the fest is the characters of uh, simple people. Uh, in um, uh, there is a, lo uh, a lot of uh, celebration uh, f in um, in simple circle that intellectual is uh, intellectual exactly. circle. It's so an off day at school at the end. Yeah. Children have a an off day, so they want to, they need to know what it's about. Yes, and so this is the the, the way to transmit that uh, this is a very uh, this is a good place. Uh, uh, for everyone, not exactly. only for Chile, but for all the community. Yeah. And uh, uh, I really thanks for this uh, project, no? because uh, um, it's uh, an, a very good example to uh, transmit uh, um, how all the society can be 
uh, 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 implicated to mm. construct uh, this intangible heritage. Great. Yes. Sylvia, would you like to follow yeah. up on that? Yes, sure. Um, so it was an amazing example. So I think that it's, it's really great what they have done. And I think that it's very important to work with, with children and to involve them because, and, and this approach with events, as Chiara was mentioning, I think it's very important because it's part of our, our daily life. So for example, um, my daughter has uh, classmates that are Muslim mm -hmm. and nobody explains her anything. Mm -hmm. So, and, and it could be a good point, for example, to bring them together and to promote this idea of intercultural dialogue and, and to provide these new meanings that was mentioned already. And I would like to bring also and to connect with this idea of the European New Bauhaus, mm -hmm. because uh, this idea of inclusive, sometimes when, when we hear about inclusivity, we think, for example, about people with disabilities or we think, for example, about people with different backgrounds trying to promote this intercultural dialogue, mm -hmm. but should be also uh, promoting this intergenerational dialogue. Exactly. And we don't have these tools mm -hmm. right now. I was trying to think about examples where, for example, um, older pe elder people could be together with children or could be, and, yeah. and it's hard to find this. And for example, religious heritage could be a good connection point in in this sense definitely like bringing elderly old, older people and youngsters together and have the older people tell about their stories life stories connected to that place in a way to pass on the history to a next generation i think it's a really really compelling example um of how it could work and i i also listening to mr rankati and his uh, his uh, explanation of the uh, new european bauhaus I also think that the Garmavolde de Groningen example is a very good example, is a showcase of how uh, contents are work together with uh, a very new uh, present day design. Because this really brings together architects, you are an architect, Yara, yes, uh, in uh, telling and adding the story to uh, a chapter to this ongoing uh, story. So in that case, um, I think um, this is uh, this is this is continuity, but also change. It, I think it all comes together in uh, in a showcase like this, in an example like this, to which many more could be added. Yeah, if if we connect it also with with the previous panel, uh, it was mentioned this values approach also. So I think that um, when when we think sometimes in heritage, we focus on. On, on stones only, or, yeah. or mainly, or this conservation, but it's not only conservation, but it's also this use and this community and intangible heritage, like events or like can, can also be part of, of this and should be part. So, and I think that children is, uh, are especially open to this mm. new, new way of looking at heritage. I don't know, because uh, when, when, they are the, when they enter a space, they, they may be, um, more, more open to perceive different ideas or, or different impressions. For example, um, one thing that was mentioned is that beauty becomes powerful because it's related to the way we experience the place. Exactly. And there are many different ways of experiencing. Yeah. And I think that children have also a very special way of experiencing these sites. So it should be also mm. try to be developed and promote tools to, to provide this, these experiences as well. Beautiful. I think this, this idea of including different generations and different uh, communities and society is very central also to uh, our next um, item, which um, um, is the result of a call for papers that was launched uh, by the conference uh, committee um, uh, working for this Barcelona um, event. And the aim was, of course, to invite people to, on stage to present their projects uh, and their papers at the foreseen physical conference uh, here in the city. Uh, which, of course, then sh was changed into this uh, hybrid format. Um, one of the papers selected by the scientific committee for that conference was the project by Thorsten Kruse from the University of Münster in Germany on religious monuments in the complex historical and political com context of Cyprus. And we will watch this contribution now. So may I ask you to start the video?
We're happy to welcome uh, Thorsten Cruz uh, here today. Uh, there were many wonderful abstracts submitted to the, the, this conference and the conference committee selected the best ones to be showcased in presentations. So uh, today we're showcasing Thorsten Cruz's presentation on the case of religious sites and their future use, the case of Cyprus. Um, please, you can begin. Joy, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends, let's take a little excursion to Cyprus. The Cyprus conflict uh, has many facets. Uh, in the area of religious heritage, it means that the situation on the island in this area is completely different from almost everywhere else in Europe. The tragic partition of the island in 1974 caused uh, an internal displacement of thousands of Cypriots and their spatial separation. Another consequence was that nearly all Greek Orthodox churches in the north and many mosques in the south could no longer be used by the faithful. In total, this affects more than 300 villages and towns on the island. In the north, nearly all churches were looted and desecrated immediately after the Turkish occupation in 1974. These traces can still be found today. Later, the churches were converted in numerous cases, such a conversion, for example, as a mosque or cultural center. This certainly ensured that the buildings were preserved. Uh, however, uh, such an approach is completely against the position of the Greek Orthodox Church of Cyprus, according to which a church is always a church and cannot be converted or reused. There's no question that the conversion of churches into storage rooms or animal stables something that unfortunately also happened very often is not an acceptable uh, use in any way. To a much lesser extent, there was also damage to mosques in the south. Here we saw no conversions, but a great number of buildings were left to themselves for years and were exposed to natural decay. Since the 2000s, the government of the Republic of Cyprus has ensured that the mosques are largely maintained or restored. Until 1974, most mosques in Cyprus were very simple and often had no minerals. It should all be, also be noted that the majority of the mosques cannot be used in a proper way because, for example, in many cases there are no working facilities for ritual ablution. Due to the distance, this concerns to mosques in the south, or restriction other use of the churches in the north, very few of these places of worship can be used by the original worshippers to this day. There are two examples, at least, that offer some hope for improvement. One is the monastery of Apostolus Andreas at the tip of the Kapas Peninsula in the northern part. The almost derelict church and the, and the adjacent buildings have been undergoing extensive repairs since 2000, 2013. The costs for this are largely borne jointly by the Greek Orthodox Church of Cyprus and the Pius Islamic Foundation, FKAF, which is usually responsible for the administration of Muslim places of worship in Cyprus. In November 2016, the first phase was completed and a service could be held in the church. Unfortunately, due to political restrictions, it is difficult to hold regular services and large pilgrimages have to be organized and approved well in at once. Um, the second example is the Hala Sultan Teke. This complex is the most important Islamic pilgrimage site in Europe and one of the most important destinations for Islamic pilgrims worldwide. It is located near the Larnaca International Airport at a salt lake. This facility was also initially left to its own devices after the partition. From 2000, 2001 onwards, great efforts were made to extensively renovate this complex. The funds were provided by USAID and the Bicommunal Development Program of Cyprus. Since the September 2008, regular prayers and Friday prayers have been held in the mosque again. It should be noted, however, that the entire area has been uh, declared as a historical monument by the Department of Antiquities. 
As a result, there are only limited opening hours similar to a museum. To date, only two of the five daily prayers are possible in the Halat Sultan Teke Mosque. Exceptions for special events such as Eid at the end of Ramadan or larger pilgrimages from the north have to be planned and applied for well in advance. The political impact of the, of, the, of the conflict unfortunately also affects religious freedom and prevents at the moment any substantial plans on how to deal with abandoned or non-usable religious sites in the future. The costly restoration and reconstruction of these sites would currently only create a large unused museum. Due to the, to the absence of the ancestral faithful, such an approach would also not contribute to continuity in function or use. Other solutions such as community engagement or in the field of digital heritage need to be discussed. A sustainable solution can therefore only emerge in close cooperation between the religious communities and politics. So far my short excursion to Cyprus. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. Um, if anybody from the audience would like to uh, get in contact with uh, Thorsten Cruz, uh, feel free to contact us at FRH and we will uh, relay the message. Thank you once again, uh, Thorsten Cruz, and many thanks. Great. I think this case of Cyprus has, is, is very interesting to all of us uh, because it reminds us, I think, in the first place, of the role of religious heritage as symbols of identity. Uh, identities that sometimes compete with others and may lead to exclusion. This prompts, I think, as one of the basic questions with all, for all of us in, in the heritage sector working with religious heritage. Whose heritage is it that we are working with? Um, even if tensions may not always run as high as on Cyprus, I think in many of our practices, in our cases, religious heritage sites is claimed by certain groups uh, or individuals, perhaps with noble intentions and for good reasons, uh, which at the same time may lead to exclusion of, of others. And, and then the question is how to deal with it. Ownership also could be cultural ownership, creates differences between communities. And it enriches communities as well because it, it differentiates and, and makes the, the, the multiple claims, etc., may make the sites even more interesting. But the, of course, the, the challenge is to, to, to manage that and to, and to make the, treasure, the threshold to these places as low as possible for everybody. So I would like to invite the panelists to reflect on that. And how do you in practice maybe make sure that this, or in your research, uh, how do you work with this, with a, a lowering the threshold as much as possible? May I yeah. start? Yes, please, so, of course, Sylvia. It, um, so I think it's a, it's a difficult point because you have to find a, a balance because, yeah, of, of course, um, religious sites are, are very close with this idea of identity. Mm. But um, to put you an example, there are some world heritage sites, around 20% of uh, world heritage sites that are inscribed in the UNESCO list are have some spiritual or religious values. Some of these sites were included for its religious values, for example, let's say, because it was a, a Buddhist temple and the community around is not Buddhist anymore. So they are, for example, exactly. uh, Islamic communities or so. And, and this is like a, a, a big issue because you have a, a site, a heritage site, and you promote the value of, of being a very important Buddhist temple, for example, but community living around is, is not Buddhist, so they mm -hmm. don't feel identified with this, or even they may feel excluded. So this is important to, to address. And, and this requires to have these uh, management tools and management plans and have this idea connecting with what we're saying before of inclusivity mm -hmm. and thinking that communities also are changing and that now we are living in in a very complex society with people with different religious backgrounds for example coming from different places exactly. yeah that may approach this heritage in different ways so we should face this mm -hmm. yes, i think yes. in this sense that there is very simple and very elementary reflection if you want but 
uh, elementary as, as it is, I think it is useful also to face the challenges we have here with this kind of heritage mm -hmm. and has much to, uh, a lot to do with, with what you said, that is that it is useful to detach uh, strict ownership of this heritage with a wide, uh, to, from, from a wider concept of property, if you want, mm -hmm. because there is somebody some uh, th there is always somebody who is the owner of this church the legal owner for uh, the, the le legal owner yep. let's say but this heritage as heritage it belongs yes to the society and even if even to the world the to the worldwide community if you want it, 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 if we are interested in the in the case of cyprus it means that those churches and mosques belong to us exactly. in some they have something in, in some sense us. in yeah. some sense so Detaching this and and uh, having a, a a growing conscience, uh, a consciousness and, and awareness of this will help us all to approach those issues in the right way. Mm -hmm. uh, for for the church here in, in Catalonia, for instance, to understand that this this is uh, the heritage owned by the church, but it is open to everyone and available to everyone, exactly, and has a message to everyone. But it has it, to be enjoyed it, by everyone, yeah. Exactly. But I, I think it, what it takes then is, is to a changed narrative, a new narrative, redesign the narrative, uh, be more inclusive and open in the way you present without forgetting your where you come from, without forgetting the core community, without mm. the reason why the... Yeah, that's, that's the point. Back. So the, the churchgoers will have their own narrative yeah. and the experts will have their own narrative. They cannot be neglected. Mm -hmm. They will say significant things, but everyone must be able to provide his own narrative or her exactly. own narratives and that uh, all 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 of them combined yeah. will give uh, a shared sense to this heritage it's like creating a choir of of multiple voices and narratives connected to that place which which in the end only enriches the site but but this has another for me an important challenge that is um how you promote or how you you try to to grant the access to everyone mm -hmm. to this heritage, for example, because we were referring to to different sites that sometimes um, they may have, for example, some fees or or they may be closed, for example, because no, it was mentioned in Cyprus that it's yes. only open yep. for for a specific hour. So, so how can you assure somehow that anyone that wants to enjoy or wants to 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 feel or to experience this heritage is, is available to do this? Yeah, well, uh, context may differ. In Cyprus, it's a political matter, for instance, mm -hmm. and here it would be rather a, a resource uh, issue. So, uh, for instance, the public administrations are willing to collaborate with the owner, in this case, the, the Catholic Church, for care of the buildings. And in this sense, the community, the whole community represented by the public powers are willing to take part in this, but uh, uh, to give uh, to this heritage a cultural life means a lot of resources, even if only to keep churches open. Mm -hmm. So one of the one of the lines, working lines of Catalonia Sacra is open churches. Exactly. So how to guarantee that churches are open? There is somebody there that can uh, accompany the visitors, or uh, or just for the church to be open. Yeah. And this is. Uh, this is a matter that involves all agents, but it has an economic side, of course. And then it's, it's where involvement has to be proved <laughs> and demonstrated and enacted yeah, by all yeah. the agents involved. Yeah. An open door is, is, is fundamental for people yeah. to, uh, to, ch to, uh, to take the, um, the invitation and, and see what, what this place has to tell to them. So, yeah, thank you for these, uh, these reflections. Um, I think um, this um, uh, brings us uh, to uh, the next item of our uh, of our program uh, today, um, which is uh, really uh, yeah, uh, uh, which is about the uh, outputs of a program that was called uh, Skivre, which is the uh, acronym of Skills Development for the Valorization of European Religious Heritage, which was an EU project that ended in February 2021 and in which FRH was a full partner. And this item will be presented to us by our FRH manager, Jordi Mayarak. I'm happy to present SCIFRA, the Skills Development for the Valorization of Religious Heritage. This Erasmus Plus 
program funded by the European Union ran from 2018 to 2021. FRH was a proud partner of the consortium, and I would like to share its outputs with all the conference participants. Skivra uh, had as a purpose to improve the skills of European monasteries in the development, production, and marketing of high-quality products. Also, sharing best practices of these monasteries and helping establish distribution strategies, marketing strategies, and branding strategies for the products. So we believe that the revitalization of the historic crafts of monasteries is very important, not just because of the high quality products, which of course are very sustainable. They're usually local, zero kilometer products, ecological if they're food related items, they're fair trade, they involve the local communities, both in the directly involved in the production or in the sales in the monastic shops. Also, these products, uh, the income of them were uh, used traditionally and still continue to be used to maintain these monastic communities and especially the, monast uh, the religious heritage sites in which these monastic communities reside. This partnership was uh, focused and addressed at the monastic shops, so secular staff working there and also monks and nuns in monastic communities. And we had a very multidisciplinary team working on it. So we had all these partners you can see here from various uh, countries across Europe. So from uh, Germany, Austria, from Greece, Bulgaria, and Belgium. Uh, they included business developers, training providers, uh, IT specialists, uh, monastery, and of course the FRH uh, European network. Initially, we did a survey on the training needs of, of these monasteries. We, we surveyed 20 monasteries and we identified there was a, a main lack of knowledge in how to sell the products, how to uh, use social media to support the sales, how to label products adequately, how to um, establish networks with local uh, partners beyond the regional borders, collaborate with sales supporters, improve sales channels. Um, and they expressed the need and, and the, the, uh, the want for training in uh, categorizing product portfolios, uh, improving their brand, using local and regional networks. So, uh, for example, the Trappist have a wonderful international network. So, in some cases, these networks exist. In some cases, they have monastic production isolated in itself and uh, with no connections with local or national networks. So, the, this was a, a perceived need that we hopefully fulfilled with our output. Um, the output were 10 online training modules in four different languages. There's uh, many good practice examples, good practice videos from different monastic production sites, uh, an implementation guide for marketing the monastic products, and also a publication on the historic crafts of monasteries, focusing on their social entrepreneurship uh, potential. The training modules in, in four languages, English, German, Bulgarian, and Greek, uh, of course, linked to the, to the partners and uh, having interacted with local monasteries in these countries, uh, um, focus on a wide range of, of, of issues from marketing strategies to how to mon uh, market and sell monastic products in an authentic way so they, they don't lose their intrinsic value of being produced in this monastic site and they maintain their the core spirit um, the social media and communication how to brand it adequately and how to be sustainable in your production the good practices uh, also are, are very interesting. They, they cover various monasteries across Europe and even around the world and focus on a specific type of uh, activity they're involved with. So in some cases it's about branding and other ones on selling authentically and other ones on sustainable production, local pr products, uh, food specific items. We have good practice videos that are also very interesting to see. Some of them uh, conducted by our partners in situ in a monastery. Uh, so very interesting to have a look into. And they offer very uh, good case studies on how uh, monastic shops and monastic production should ideally be uh, organized. The implementation guide uh, is a self-evaluation tool which allows the user to um, identify what their lacks are and uh, to go through this checklist 
and um, be redirected to the training modules. So if you start and it's overwhelming, there's too much material, and you're, for example, working in a monastic shop, you can use the implementation guide, go through the checklist and see exactly what you might be lacking, and then you're addressed to this particular module. The publication is also very interesting and it focuses on the historic crafts of monasteries and, and how they can be used for social entrepreneurship. It's a very interesting read, so I highly recommend it. And of course, uh, this uh, output is certified by the uh, un um, uh, German university, so you can obtain a, a certificate. So how to use this effectively? You can go to the training platform. It's free, open to everyone. It's uh, this training.skipper.eu. You can go to the training module uh, of your choice. You can use the implementation guide. Each training module has a self-evaluation test at the end to monitor how well you've integrated this knowledge and uh, finally you can look at good practice examples and uh, on this publication on historic crafts and so of course this uh, project output is mainly oriented to monastic uh, production sites to monastic communities and uh, monastic shop uh, managers but it's also for the general uh, public as um, the case studies and, and these uh, videos are very interesting in, in themselves and uh, so it's a very interesting read to learn about what types of, of marvelous project, uh, products are, are produced across Europe and the world, uh, what communities are, are involved in their production, the history of their production that often comes from medieval times. So yes, I highly recommend it. Here's all the, the websites and, and social media in case you want more information. And if you have any questions or want to be put in contact with any of the, of the uh, monastic production sites or want to share additional information with us or share some case studies or base practices or anything interesting, feel free to contact us at info at frhurope.org. And uh, well, uh, thank you very much for your participation in this conference. Thank you. Thank you, Jordi, for this, uh, for this nice presentation. We now move on to uh, the Jump for Heritage campaign, combining sports and heritage, which was a great success. It ran from December 15th until May 15th, 2021. As was announced in the welcoming speech of our president, Pilar Bamonde, today we will present the winners. But first, let me give you a glimpse of the contributions received to give you an impression of the diversity of participants, pictures, and the geographical spread. And this is only an impression because we received many more pictures than we can show to you here very briefly. So we now start the presentation and we move across Europe. We move from Germany with beautiful churches and jumping people in the winter and in the spring to Spain where we see this beautiful jump by the choir a jump in the southeast to France which was the biggest contributor and also included a synagogue and move then to Italy with a sports jump, including badminton. To the UK and Ireland. Amazingly creative, you saw the dog even jumping into the competition. And there's Ireland. And then we move to Greece, in the southeast, jumps in the sun. And then we move to the Netherlands starting with a real sports contribution and there we recognize famous historical figures Van Oldenbarneveld and Johannes Vermeer, the famous painter and there's Harmer Bolde, you already recognize and we fly over Russia Romania with the World Heritage Painted Monastery we move to Belgium And then onwards, eastwards to Slovakia. And 
and to Serbia and to Lithuania, Hungary. I'm even losing the track. <laughs> and here we are in Cyprus. And then finally we end, and there's Serbia. Wow, it keeps moving. Wow, this is really a very uh, dynamic campaign. And then we end up with this picture coming from Kathmandu, showing Sebastian Alvaro, a famous mountaineer who boosted our campaign from places all over the world. On behalf of FRH, we want to thank all the people who helped us build a successful campaign by sending in so many contributions from so many different countries. And you see some of them in the next slides pictures, which you may recognize if you followed our campaign. And let's now start our official award ceremony. The JUMP campaign brought so many beautiful contributions that it was a hard job to pick a final winner. Therefore, FRH has decided to present not one, but two prizes. One for the category of individuals and one for the category of groups. We are very grateful for the sponsors who made it possible that to offer the prize of, thousand, of a thousand euros twice and also to the jury who supported FRH in the final selection of the winners, Mrs. Tabea Schwarze from the Kunsthalle in Karlsruhe and Mr. Miguel Angel de Arriba. Individuals' top finalists were Corina Karalexidou, jumping in front of the church of Panagia Chalkion, an 11th century Byzantine church in the city of Thessaloniki in Greece. Angela Lopez, jumping on the rooftop of the Jesuit church in Valencia in Spain. And Georgia Gliudi in Cyprus, a beautiful picture of one of the most important religious heritage sites on the island the uh, site which was mentioned in uh, the uh, presentation by uh, Thorsten Kruse, the Hala Sultan Tekke. Those are the three finalists in the individuals group. Then we move to the group of, uh, of the category of groups. First are Damiana, Mija, Matea and Tjasha jumping in Slovenia, a group of colleagues for the Socha Valley Tourist Board that take care of the church in Javorca, a place of European memory. And here we have Carmen Corchero from Spain, the Yo Soy Loco dancers at the Porticada Gallery of the Ermita de San Benito in Huelva in Andalusia in southern Spain. And here we recognize Harma Volde again showing Remco and Meerte de Raad in the Netherlands jumping in front of their school church in Harma Volde. Mr. Sebastian Alvaro will now announce the final two winners via a video message. Mr. Alvaro, please. Hello, FRH. My name is Sebastian Alvaro. Estoy muy feliz de contribuir a la campaña Saltando por Nuestro Patrimonio. Y estoy muy contento de anunciar el vencedor en categorías individuales a Angelina López, de Valencia. Muchas felicidades. Y el vencedor en categoría de grupos es Carmen Corchero y sus bailarines Yo Soy Loco. Muchas felicidades a ambos. Felicidades, amigos. We join in the congratulations and give a modest hybrid applause to the winners. Congratulations. Now, at last, we move towards the closure of this event by showing a music video. If it would have been possible to gather here in Barcelona in person, 
we would certainly have taken you to Montserrat Monastery, which you all three, but especially you, Silvia Olet, know very well, to meet and enjoy its historical and natural wonders and listen to the famous choir. But we cannot, and therefore we decided to treat you on a short musical performance by the Montserrat Choir together with the famous Catalan singer. Please enjoy. Fantastic music, fantastic sight, fantastic landscapes. We've come to the uh, conclusion of this hybrid event. And I would like to finish it by saying many, many thanks to all who have joined us from all over Europe and even beyond uh, in this first out of a range of four hybrid events under the main theme of living religious heritage. And you will be updated over the next weeks about these next events which come up. 
And please join me in uh, a big virtual applause for the FRH team and the technical support here at the MACBA in Barcelona, who have done a wonderful job in making this event possible and broadcasting it all over the world. Our discussions have clearly shown, I think, that religious heritage is not only a bridge to the past, which connects us to our own past and the past of us as a community as wide as possible, but also to a future to which we will hand on these wonderful, this wonderful heritage, these wonderful sites. Thank you very much and see you next time. Bye-bye from Barcelona.